progress since Paris or more hot air? Two years after the landmark agreement on climate change, world leaders have been meeting again. They're under pressure to deliver more than just a photo opportunity. We'll hear from the CEO of the World Bank. We are running out of time. And we'll visit one community that faces losing it all to rising sea levels. With the United States set to pull out of the Paris deal, are we seeing meaningful results on global warming or more empty promises? Hello, I'm Rida Fakhri and you're watching a special program as we ask whether we really are witnessing a climate of change. Hello from Washington, D.C. In a year of extraordinary statements coming out of the building right behind me, it was among the most memorable. Donald Trump's decision to pull the U.S. out of the global agreement to fight climate change caused outcry around the world, the latest U.S. policy to go up in smoke. The American president made it clear he is not prepared to play the role of global leader on climate action, but others certainly are. Leaders from a host of countries met in Paris on the two-year anniversary of the deal that was signed there, all of them knowing that the battle against global warming has barely begun. And while the photo ops and the commemorations continued in the French capital, for many people across the world, the dangers of not acting fast enough are becoming all too real. Like the Guna of Panama, they face losing their homes on the low-lying San Blas Islands within the next generation. Our correspondent, Annelise Borges, went to see what is happening there. An isolated people and culture who are about to lose their paradise. The Guna Indians of Panama are at the forefront of the battle against climate change. And despite not being familiar with the term, they have a vague idea of what's all about. Things are changing. There are many satellites now up there in the sky, and they can see the weather is getting warmer. Juan de Leon was born and grew up in the San Blas Islands and believes the Guna would be better off staying put. Absolutely everything we need is right here in these islands. But scientists say the islands have an expiration date. Our data indicate that there is between three and six millimeters per year increase in the levels in the Caribbean. Well, Cunayala live in the Caribbean, so, and their islands tend to be very low compared to the sea level. It's almost certain that they're going to have to give up, abandon some of those islands. The Guna General Congress, the administrative authority here, already has plans to relocate these people to another part of their territory on Panama's eastern coast. But moving away from the sea will have an impact on Guna traditions. The ocean is a vital part of the Guna's culture. They have a synergy with it. They're constantly in the water. Their economy and lifestyle revolve around it. They depend on the ocean to feed themselves and to get around. And so it will be extremely difficult for the Gunas to adapt to a new reality of mainland living. But scientists say there's no turning back and that hundreds of millions of people worldwide live in areas that will eventually be submerged by rising sea levels as a result of global warming. And the Guna people may watch their land be washed away sooner than most. Annelise Borges, CRC World, San Blas Islands. Well, if that trend of rising seas and rising temperatures is to be reversed, there's pressure on the politicians and officials who met in Paris to prove they can deliver. Among them, leaders of the World Bank, which helped to organize the summit. Kristalina Georgieva is the bank's chief executive officer. She has been heading its efforts to combat climate change. I sat down with her before she went to France and started by asking her about her organization's main concerns and priorities. Top of mind for all of us has to be that we are the first generation to experience the impact of climate change and we are the last generation that can do something serious about it. When we look at the uh, uh, position we find ourselves as a world, it is very worrying. 
Uh, after a couple of years of CO2 emissions staying flat, this last year they have started growing again. The world is coming out of economic crisis and uh, unfortunately uh, with the good news of, of better economic performance comes the bad news of growing uh, carbon emissions. And more serious than the growth of emissions is their impact. 15,000 scientists told us in Bonn during COP23 that we are running out of time. But who has the prime responsibility, though, when you gather so many heads of states? Are we going to see yet another international gathering of, of leaders congratulating themselves? Or w will we hear the sounding of alarm bells this time? Because clearly we're off track, aren't we? Uh, we are going to bring uh, together in Paris 12 teams where investments are being either generated because of this gath gathering or they are being accelerated. And what we also are stressing, and I think the World Bank has been for many years the strongest voice on that, mitigation, critical to do. But for many of the poorest countries and poorest people, it is not so much about mitigation. It is about adapting to the tremendous risk of climate change. And you mentioned these uh, developing countries are looking to developed countries to live up to their pledges, in fact, to help them mitigate the effects of climate change and transition to renewable energy. But are developed countries living up to their pledges? What we have seen is that uh, a, a number of countries that have made commitments have actually uh, delivered on these commitments. Uh, even the United States, in terms, though, in, in, in terms of sticking to uh, their emissions being at the level uh, they had them in 1990. Uh, practically the whole universe of the of developed economies, if you look at their uh, carbon uh, trajectories, they have managed to grow and at the same time reduce their carbon uh, emissions. Where emissions uh, continue to be uh, more accelerated is in some of the developing countries where growth is uh, much higher. I think of countries like India, 8% growth, or uh, China, 8% uh, growth. Uh, there we still have to, to see a faster transformation. What is encouraging is you listen to leaders of these countries, they're serious. But how serious are the leaders of some of these countries? I mean, when you look at the United States, for example, this is the world's second largest uh, polluter. Uh, when you hear the Trump administration's uh, pledge to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, granted this will not go into effect any time before the end of the Trump administration, how much should it matter to the rest of the world not to have the United States in the Paris Agreement? The world has taken Paris seriously. And it is really no more dependent on one or another voice, even these are big uh, voices. But nonetheless, I think the symbolism of a country like the United States, and let me push you one more time on this issue, mm -hmm. the symbolism behind its pledge to withdraw, and everything can change, of course, between now and then, or by the time mm -hmm. perhaps another president gets into the, the, the Oval Office. But, but shouldn't it be more important to international organizations uh, like the World Bank, like the United Nations? Shouldn't we hear more said about this issue? Because I presume that if China or India or any other such country had reneged on its promise, we would have heard more. Well, if you uh, listen to what my organization has said, the day after there was a pronouncement, it was a very clear message. Climate action is critical for development. If we fail, there is a very high probability that the number of people in extreme poverty, rather than going down at the, as it has been over the last decades, will be climbing up. Uh, we project that some 100 million people could fall into extreme poverty because of climate-related event in the next decade. And later in the program, you can hear more from the World Bank's CEO on who is stepping up to lead in the US's absence and the multi-billion dollar question of who funds the fight against climate change. 
Now, the reality of climate change highlights what for many is the injustice of the global system, with poorer countries paying the price for the actions of the dominant players. James Champion has our five facts. Three countries contribute almost half the world's CO2 emissions. They are China, the United States and India. That's almost the same as the remaining 192 countries in the world put together. Others pollute and the poorest pay. Africa, the world's poorest continent, is set to suffer the most from climate change. It contributes less than 4% of greenhouse gas emissions. By 2030, as many as 250 million people will be exposed to water stress caused by climate change, according to the United Nations. The poorest nations face a funding battle. Under the Paris Agreement, richer nations pledged to give $100 billion per year to help the poorest switch to cleaner energy. But so far, as little as $3 billion is being handed over each year. Fossil fuels would have to stay in the ground. To meet the Paris target of limiting the average temperature rise to two degrees globally, huge amounts of fuel would have to go untapped. Between now and 2050, that amounts to 33% of oil, 50% of natural gas, and 80% of coal that would have to stay in the ground. So far, no country has pledged to leave fossil fuels untouched. China is the biggest polluter, but has one of the most ambitious carbon plans. In 2016, China emitted more than 10 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. That's nearly one third of the global total. But it has pledged to cap pollution growth. And China is also about to launch the world's biggest carbon trading scheme, where polluting companies can buy credits from cleaner ones. Joining me now is Fred Palmer, who is Senior Fellow for Energy and Climate at the Heartland Institute, a think tank that has consistently questioned the evidence on man-made climate change. Fred Palmer, one of the startling facts we just heard is that to meet the Paris goals, 80% of coal would have to stay in the ground <laughs> untapped. Isn't it time to stop funding and subsidizing fossil fuels? Well, you know, the President Obama was even more extreme. Uh, President Obama in the second year of his of his office, his, his, the last four years, was for leaving all fossil fuels in the ground. The Democratic Party platform in 2016 is by 2050 is to eliminate the use of all fossil fuels. So that that is a, an inconceivable proposition. It's Why not? Bad. Why it's, not? It's Wouldn't bad it be, for would, because would it, it hurts people. Who would it people. be bad for? People. It's bad for what people. What people? Because obviously the trends are. Uh, opinion polls show that a majority of Americans, forget people around the world, a majority of, of Americans want to see more investment in cleaner energy. That's we are, the trend. Uh, the proposition we're talking about is eliminating entirely the use of fossil fuels in the name of climate change. And I grew up in the American West, in Phoenix, Arizona, the entire, um, every, everywhere outside the Beltway in the United States uh, lives because of and thrives because of fossil fuels, not in spite of them. But how can you say that? I mean, you've, you've been saying that it's part of a divine plan. Do you seriously think that it contributes to people <laughs> living better and longer? No question. H how is that? Life expectancy since Al Gore started this argument has, a, has gone up by 15 years uh, worldwide. There are billions more people on Earth since this controversy started. When the controversy started in, in let's say, roughly 1990, but uh, we're, we use billions of tons more coal every year than we did. There are billions more people. They are living longer. They are living better. Food production is at records. Uh, wealth is increasing, and it is because of fossil fuels, not in spite of fossil fuels. Well, you know, fuels. many people would say this is simply uh, a campaign of misinformation, that it is politicians and lobbyists like you who've been denying the human cause of climate change, the effects of climate change, who've been spending millions of dollars to influence government, who are holding this whole debate hostage here in the United States. Isn't it time to really step it up and, and hold polluters accountable? CO2 is a benign gas required for life on Earth. As more CO2 is put in the air, the Earth greens, food production is at record levels, 
more people live longer and live better. Why are more are, people then moving toward greener energy? Big there oil are three, companies are there doing are, that. Excuse me. There are three billion people on Earth that have no access to electricity or energy. Three billion people. They live on the land. They denude the land. They strip it. But take. that is not the case they in the United States it. for the most part. And even these Would developing countries, which I think you're alluding to, have been moving toward my greener concept. technology. People are moving to fossil fuels even as they deploy renewables at the same time. But isn't there a ploy there? So that because more they're people made to believe can live longer but, and live better. But isn't it, again, because they're made to believe that fossil fuels are cheap, but there's a hidden cost there, which translates in what, $20 billion in subsidies from the U.S. government? Five trillion, if you look at it on a global average. I'm going to stick to what, to what I call modernity. The, human, the, the industrial evolution of the human community has been fueled by fossil fuels. Urbanization, more coal, more oil, more natural gas, always more efficient, always cleaner, brings people out of poverty in China, in India, not Africa yet, but it will happen. It is a good thing, not bad. Mm -hmm. It is a positive. We must use more. Well, you're clearly of, out of tune. Of course, tune. we must use it cleaner. You are out of tune with the studies, every conceivable study that has been issued by scientific academies around the world, not to mention the latest major scientific study here in the US, uh, the National Climate Assessment, a comprehensive study, I should say, put together by 13 federal agencies, hundreds of scientists. Clearly, you're not. The U.S. administration is not reading its own reports, isn't listening to its own scientists. The science is based on observations, and the science needs to remember that we have had very little warming since the satellites went up in 1980, there, that we have billions of more people on Earth, that we use more and more fossil fuels all the time. When to, you say to that, that I must interrupt people. you because every part of the U.S. has been affected. Wouldn't you agree? Droughts in the Southeast, flooding in the Midwest, rising temperatures in Alaska. Isn't that evidence enough it that is something not. is happening? It is not because you haven't studied weather history. I have. Really? This is a make believe crisis by people that make you up their own science and then and the, lawyers, will, the lawyers make up their own law. We will have law. to leave it there. Fred Palmer of the Heartland Institute, thanks very much. Here in the United States, one particularly powerful force has joined the fight over climate change, the U.S. military. The Defense Department is treating it as a national security issue. But it won't be easy convincing a president and top officials who reject the science on global warming and have left the U.S. isolated as the only country not on board with the Paris Agreement. Frank Osiardo has more on the climate conflict within the U.S. government. I will cancel job-killing restrictions on the production of American energy, including shale energy and clean coal, creating many millions of high-paying jobs. Donald Trump has made it no secret of his commitment to coal and other fossil fuels, a major driver of climate change. It helped him win crucial support in last year's election, and he's keeping it on his agenda. At a recent U.N. meeting on climate change, there were protests as the U.S. delegation pushed a plan to keep using coal. Like tobacco at a cancer conference was how one delegate put it, an accusation rejected by the Trump team. Some people have called it provocative. You know, I think we would disagree. Key members of Trump's cabinet are climate change skeptics. His energy secretary, Rick Perry, once pledged to scrap the department altogether and says the science is out on whether humans cause climate change. Scott Pruitt is the head of the Environmental Protection Agency. In his old job, he sued the agency 14 times, intending to block its regulations in favor of fossil fuel producers. But Trump faces major opposition from within. A recent report by 13 federal agencies found that man-made climate change is a reality, not a theory, and that the U.S. alone has borne a cost of $1.1 trillion for these weather extremes since 1980. The U.S. military is taking climate change seriously, too. Defense Secretary James Mattis has described it as a national security issue for America. He's concerned about possible instability in the many countries where the U.S. has military bases or where its troops are operating. And the U.S. Congress agrees. It recently passed a law stating that climate change is a direct threat to national security and that the military needs to prepare. Where are our naval bases, for example? They're at sea level. So, you know, if indeed climate change causes the oceans to rise, it will, by definition, destroy our naval bases. But publicly, at least, Trump is still going his own way. We're going to put 
the miners back to work. We're going to put the miners back to work. The president digs coal, despite what many of his own advisors are saying. So how big a threat is climate change to the security of the United States? Let's talk to our guest, retired Brigadier General Jerry Galloway. He is a professor who focuses on the subject at the University of Maryland. And Marla Lewis is a senior fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, a conservative think tank here in Washington. Brigadier General, the U.S. administration clearly going against the current internationally. But looking at the issue from a domestic perspective, how big a deal is climate change when it comes to the U.S.'s own national security? Well, Napoleon once said an army travels on its stomach, but in reality, in the 21st century, the military forces have to be attentive to weather and, and terrain and climate. Climate dictates uh, what the nature of the warfare will be. It dictates the uh, operational environment. It also uh, influences your installations, the, the platforms from which we launch our soldiers and sailors overseas. But if it is an issue, if instability around the world breeds conflict, if it affects the U.S.'s hundreds of military installations around the world, why are we seeing such a pushback by the Trump administration? Well, you're not seeing a pushback. Uh, it's certainly in the Defense Department. General Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, has said, I believe that that's a real issue. But they we are claim. seeing one in the White House, though. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how, uh, if you're looking for what is the influence on the military, the military says, everywhere you go, both with us and our allies, that it is a challenge and that we have to do something about it. And I have not seen any instructions from the White House that uh, they should back off from that. The, the Secretary of Defense has said that. The Chief of Staff of the Army has said that. They've talked about the necessity to be aware and to be prepared for it. You would not expect us to be going into war not knowing what the circumstances are. And that's what it is with climate change. We've got to be prepared. If Norfolk Naval Station is going underwater slowly as a result of sea level rise, you have to be ready to launch ships from there. So. Would the U.S. be ready? Because clearly the Trump administration, at least certain segments within the administration, are not lending this issue the kind of seriousness they should. How do you see it? Well, as far as readiness uh, for infrastructure that's critical for, our, for the deployment of our military forces and for training exercises and so on, um, all of those climate change impacts, to the extent that they're happening, are quite gradual. Um, we're, if we're talking about sea level rise, for example, it's, you know, it's a millimeter or so a year. These are the kinds of impacts that can be addressed um, very routinely through routine maintenance, repair, and upgrading of facilities. This is nowhere near close to an existential threat. So, so so you're suggesting yeah. that climate change should not be a national security priority for the U.S.? N not a priority, no. It's, it's certainly something that, uh, you know, one should think about, but I don't think it's a good idea to make climate change strategies and assessments or to integrate those into every office and every program of the Pentagon the way the Obama administration tried to do. I think that diverts attention from far more serious threats and, uh, and just creates a kind of uh, mission creep excuse to ask Congress for more money for, for things that really don't address the main threats that Brigadier we're facing. General, as a military man, how do you see this? Is well, it a complete our, waste of time and money for Congress to be looking into this? Military leaders who are in the theaters, who have the responsibility for dealing with the wars that might exist or the humanitarian assistance, disaster recovery missions that we have, have seen them grow. We also know, I mean, the most recent climate assessment that the, Pen or the uh, White House released does say that the intensity of storms is growing, the increase in rainfall is large. I just came from Houston. Houston is reeling from 51 inches of rain. We haven't seen that before. You can go around not only this country, but around the world. You better be ready for that. It's not something we can wait for. I'm not sure the millimeter plays the game because sea level rise is coming, but intense storms put uh, the, the surge on top of that. And the surge is what did great damage in Katrina. It's done it in other storms. And it's happening all around the world. So we have a, a challenge. Our equipment's got to be able to, for example, offload ships in a high sea. The seas are higher now. Uh, we see problems with sea level rise on islands in the Pacific, our Pacific bend. Many people are interested in being ready to go where we need to go. And I think the American public expects us to be ready for that. Don't have to do everything by 2100. And so is, is the American military, is the American administration ready for this type of uh, 
uh, of uh, risk around the world because clearly there's now a standard line coming out of at least the Pentagon for the past 10 years. Every Secretary of State since Chuck Hagel, Robert Gates, and now the current Defense Secretary, they all say it is a serious and direct risk to the United States well, on a national security I, level. In some, Why is in that some being ways, ignored? they're not ready. And they're not ready because they have obsessed on climate change. For example, President Obama, when he made that big trip to Alaska, that big Arctic trip, tried to make climate change the national security issue, whereas in fact the real issue was a Russian problem, not a climate problem. But, but and aren't so, you, no, wait, aren't, me, aren't you making the U.S. less ready no, no, by, by denying precisely the, opposite. the conflict uh, precisely dimension the opposite. to this issue? Russia has been expanding its fleet of icebreakers. The United States has not. <clears throat> and what Russia has seen is that if there is going to be an opening of the waters in the Arctic, then we need more ships. President Obama, that was not his conclusion. His conclusion, rather, was that we needed to suppress energy consumption here in the United States, make energy less affordable, make it harder for the economy to sustain the Defense Department through tax revenues. Completely the wrong emphasis. But Instead of emphasizing the Russian a aspect, right. he emphasized climate You're change. You're deflecting the issue, it seems to me, to Russia. But let's look at the facts. Because I'm a study, deflecting a climate study, change to a, national a, security let just, proper. Let me just quote a study that was released last year, which found that rising oceans threaten 128 military installations on the coast, including naval facilities worth $100 billion. So if nothing else, from a purely domestic vantage point, isn't it credible enough evidence that the U.S. should be I'd, focusing I'd on like this? I'd like to see that study carefully because threaten is a word that allows, it's like a big Rorschach ink blot. What does that mean? In the course of, in the nor even if there were no climate change, all of those military installations would eventually have to be upgraded, and that would cost you billions and billions of dollars. So how much of that actually is due to climate change? I'd like to see the evidence. Well, many are saying that billions of dollars are being lost to the climate deniers, but I wonder from your perspective, Brigadier General uh, Galloway, just looking at the most recent conflict in Syria, many people and politicians around the world have said that climate change factors had a direct impact on the beginning of the unrest there. President Obama has said it, his Secretary of State John Kerry said it, the EU it's all Commission nonsense. president has said it. What, what do you make well, of it? One person says nonsense. I say it's fairly well documented. We know that that's happening in many places. All you have to do, and I've been working in, in uh, I've been to Pakistan, I've worked in Singapore, I work in the Mekong. We see every day where the change in climate is affecting the people on the ground, is putting them at risk. People are migrating, a problem. People are losing their food supply, a problem. It's creating not only uh, the shortages of food, but it's creating this friction among the different classes in the communities that are affected. People are and fighting over, as you say, resources, and it's leading to mass migration. And if you can't farm the land, you go into the cities, crowding the cities is a major challenge. And as you know, one of the challenges we have in the military is urban warfare. It is very difficult. We're doing it very well. Uh, but it is something that you don't want to have people pushed off to the, the cities. You want them to live on the land if they can sustain themselves. A very important discussion, but we'll have to leave it there. Brigadier General Galloway, Marla Lewis, thank you very much indeed. My thank pleasure. You. Still ahead on this special program. No backwater bullying of businesses with broken morals. No blindfolded bureaucracies going to push this mother ocean over the edge. The activist who moved the UN with a poem of protest. But does she believe that the politicians are listening? We'll have an interview. Stay with us. Welcome back. The White House behind me may be home to a climate change denier, but the evidence is getting harder to ignore, even here in the United States. Scientists say this year's record-breaking storms were almost certainly made worse by climate change. Houston was hit by unprecedented rainfall that caused catastrophic flooding in August. Our correspondent, Edis Tiansen, went to see how people there were coping three months on. Jessica and her family are grateful that Hurricane Harvey left their home standing, even though inside it was flooded halfway to the ceiling. They've lost all their furniture and personal belongings. For the last three months, they've been living on donations, since they still haven't received any financial assistance. We had insurance, and we had to send the insurance people paper to FEMA, so they still say it's pending. We are eligible, but it's pending. So 
So they haven't done anything yet. They just say you have to get paid by the cube. Mm -hmm. The air mattresses they sleep on and the only table in the house have all been donated by their local church or the local middle school where Jessica helps out in larger donation efforts. Hundreds of pieces of clothing and school bags have been donated from other children across the country. Some with an attached note of moral support. Don't focus on tomorrow, focus on today. I know how it feels to lose your home. Mine got hit by a tornado in 2011. You are not alone. Remember that, Madison S. On top of these seasonal donations, about 90 children also receive a weekly food ration. The student council says this helps ensure some stability in the lives of children who are still displaced. Our families and our community struggles in some different ways and so with Harvey hitting it uh, definitely took another toll on, on them financially. Um, of course them having to you know leave their apartment or leave their home so now on top of things now they're having to put any extra money or the little funds that they did have into um, trying to rebuild or find new places to live and to not only that but to gather new supplies, new clothing, new furniture, those types of things. Nobody predicted that Harvey was going to hit Texas so hard. Three months on, Texans are still struggling to get back on their feet and climate change bringing more intense weather conditions than ever. The concern now is how to cope with future hurricane seasons. At University of Houston, they're watching closely for changes in weather patterns. Professor Peter Copeland says that warming temperatures will likely create more big hurricanes in the region. Well, we can consider the, the likelihood for hurricanes to be associated with the temperature of the water. And as the water, as the temperature of the ocean increases, that's the fuel for hurricanes. The chance is, is, that, is that events like Harvey, events like Maria, um, are going to be more common uh, in the future. Jessica's family know they won't be the last to suffer from extreme weather. For now, they're just doing their best to cope. It is Tian Shanti RT World, Houston, Texas. So despite the apparent threats at home, the U.S. is pulling back from its global commitments on global warming. But how much of a problem is that for the rest of the world? We spoke to Han Chen from the National Resources Defense Council. Her big idea, and her opinion, is that the world doesn't need the U.S. to lead on climate change. The world doesn't need the U.S. and Trump administration to move forward on tackling climate change. There's already so much that we've seen countries do in spite of U.S. inaction. Right now what we're seeing is that there's several countries that are leading the way when it comes to global climate action. There's China, there's India, there's the EU. China has been able to move ahead on developing wind and solar projects totaling over 300 gigawatts. Now, that's more than the total coal consumption of the U.S. combined in one year. India has also been a leader in tackling climate change because for a developing country which has a significantly lower GDP, they've actually committed to very high standards for how they will develop in the future. They have huge needs when it comes to power for a population where hundreds of millions still lack regular access to electricity. And yet they're already saying that they will provide 100 gigawatts of solar power as a way to electrify and provide rural access to electricity for many citizens. The fact that the U.S. is reneging on its global climate commitments does speak to the fact that there is a real decline in respect for the U.S. as a global superpower when it comes to these sort of issues around climate and on the environment and increasingly on energy security. The U.S. as the largest historical emitter has a responsibility to take climate action. That said, if the U.S. under the Trump administration is not willing to take action, that doesn't stop other countries such as China and India and the EU from moving forward on climate action as we need. Well, joining us now to talk more about this, our guest, Manish Bapna, is the managing director of the World Resources Institute, a research organization focusing on global sustainability. And Daniel Richter is the legislative director of the Citizens Climate Lobby, a pressure group here in Washington. And Manish Bapna, the Paris Climate Accord, although it is a voluntary agreement, was hugely symbolic significant in the fact that both heavyweight polluters, the US and China, were on board. Between the two of them, they account for 40% of global emissions. But without the US, can and will China do much of the heavy lifting? So the, the two questions people are asking are with the US 
announcing its withdrawal from Paris, will China step up and take kind of leadership? And, and the second question they're asking is, when will China peak its emissions? On the first, um, absolutely. The signals have been incredibly encouraging from the head of state down. There's every signal suggests staying in the dryer's, driver's seat, being a torchbearer, continuing to lead on climate action. And beyond signals, they've taken actions, right? They've cut down their investment in the coal industry, though they are very much a coal-based uh, economy. So, and they've also invested in renewable energy. Absolutely. So big thing about reducing how much energy they consume, shifting from heavy manufacturing to services, and then also investing significantly in renewables. Just last year, they invested almost $80 billion in solar and wind. The U.S. only invested $45 billion. So they're really um, living up to their promises. So twice as much as, as the U.S. Daniel Richter, when, when you look at the U.S., and although it's important just to, to say that it is still nominally part of the Paris Agreement, it can only actually uh, get out of the agreement uh, at the earliest, at the end of November of 2020. How will it affect the will of other countries to actually take action if the U.S. simply isn't there? Yeah, that's a that's that's another really interesting question because I think there there could be an argument that with the United States uh, withdrawing and less at the table, there could be more space to have bold conversations. Uh, you wouldn't expect the United States under this administration to be much of a facilitator of, of action. Potentially, they would be obstructionists. And uh, when President Trump was considering this, I heard uh, there was discussion of countries who have existing prices on carbon talking about putting border carbon adjustments on their prices on carbon. And I think that that would, uh, that would really be a strong forcer for the United States to take action. But how does it affect the developing world, though, to see the world's richest nation simply say it isn't interested in this whole process? Because developing countries like India still very much depend on the financial aid they would get from the, develop the developed world. It's true. Uh, I, I don't think it's good, but uh, there's the question, uh, you know, this is not an ideal circumstance that we're in if you're interested in climate change. So then in this non-ideal circumstance, uh, is there more of an opportunity where if the United States is uh, there and is perhaps playing an obstructionist role, or is there more of an opportunity if the United States is just staying out of it? I think it's bad for the United States. Uh, unambiguously. This is bad for the United States. I would prefer it if we were at the table uh, being a positive partner. But with us not there, there might be an opportunity. Well, it should be said, uh, Manish Bapna, that there are no binding rules to this agreement. So it's left right. to each country's political calculations as well to really push ahead with this. It isn't just good enough for them to sign on to this document or even ratify it. They need to actually take action. How likely, though, are they? Because many of them will likely say, well, if the U.S. isn't doing it, why should we? So th there was quite a bit of concern that with the U.S.'s announcement, will other countries just not take this seriously? But what we're seeing is this is actually stiffening the spine of a lot of countries. You have, uh, since the U.S. announced its withdrawal, every other country has signaled that they are recommitting to the Paris Agreement. You have countries like Fiji that's hosting the next climate convention, signaling they're going to go 100% renewable energy by 2030. Costa Rica is going to go carbon neutral by 2021. Countries and, are indeed and stepping European up in countries the development. As well. European countries are saying that if the U.S. isn't there to lead, some of them have even adopted the slogan climate first in Sweden, for example. Small countries wanting to go carbon neutral in, uh, in 20, 30 years' time. Uh, absolutely. And we're seeing um, in Europe quite a bit being done by some of the countries, but quite frankly, other countries can do more. And so although the Paris Agreement watershed moment, um, we need to see more. And who can take the lead? do you think, Daniel Richter? India, South Africa, uh, European countries, China, who do you see in, in the drive, driving seat moving yeah, forward? I think uh, Citizens Climate Lobby believes in market-based solutions to this. And when you look at what the options are, carbon prices, uh, either a cap and trade system or our preference would be a carbon fee or a carbon tax. That's the best way of addressing this. And when you look around the world, Eight out of the 10 largest economies in the world already have a carbon price planned or uh, for the near future or in place. But so you're saying the private sector will be key. Businesses Absolutely. hold yeah. the key to this. I think the, the private sector is key. They're the main driver. But I think the government set the, the, uh, they set the tone, they set the policy for the businesses to lead, to innovate. And I'm saying that the rest of the world is already leaving. Uh, my concern for the United States 
for the United States is that we're going to be left behind. Our businesses domestically are not being given the market signal that they are in China, in Europe, uh, even in India. They have a, it's not a carbon price, but it's a coal tax, which was recently doubled uh, when their current president came into office. A taxation is never politically appealing to anyone, but beyond the political will, which is clearly lacking here in the US, what else is lacking? Uh, do we need more of an environmentally conscious sort of populace to really throw its weight behind we, these types of decisions? So, so, so I think the big change that's happened over the past few years is an increasing recognition that climate action makes good economic policy. It's good for growth. Increasingly, we're seeing the cost of clean energy come down, be more competitive than fossil generation. People see the value of public transit. You look at what's happening in Asia and China and India, air pollution choking cities, right? People are beginning to see that for growth reasons, for pollution reasons, for human well-being, there's good reason to take climate action, and climate can just be a co-benefit. Cities and businesses have been actually taking a front seat on this. Absolutely. And you, you said, you know, what we need is a, we need movement, uh, political will, and that's exactly what Citizens Climate Lobby is, is all about. You described us as a D.C. pressure group, and uh, we actually have quite a small presence here in D.C. We're mostly everywhere else. Uh, we have 90,000 90, volunteers around the country, a volunteer every congressional district. And the essence of what CCL is, is teaching citizens how to take their citizenship to the highest level possible, uh, giving them that real world practical training for how to be a citizen, how to make your voices heard, how to bring those cities, uh, those local influencers, endorsers in your district, your community to the table to help them lift up their voices. Just finally, well. are you confident fossil fuels will be kicked off the table anytime soon? Uh, soon, absolutely. You know, the, they say the Stone Age didn't end because of a lack of stones. The same will happen with fossils. The Manish. question is, will it happen fast enough? That's, and that is what that, we need to That find. is the key question. Manish Bapna and Daniel Richter, thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. So China is taking action to start cutting the damage done by fossil fuels. I asked the World Bank CEO, Kristalina Georgieva, if we are beginning to see a complete role reversal between the two biggest polluters, the US and China. Well, China has stepped up uh, very significantly. Uh, you look at the uh, presence of China in solar, uh, some couple of years ago, uh, it was practically non-existent. They now have $80 billion strong solar production uh, industry. And they are making very firm commitments around their uh, climate emissions uh, path. Uh, so, so we see clim uh, uh, climate becoming part of the economic strategy uh, in China. But it is not only China. Uh, India made the commitment to switch to electric cars by 2030 unthinkable a couple of years ago, uh, a very strong commitment to how they're going to change their energy trajectory away from coal, unthinkable a couple of years ago. Uh, so it is countries small and big coming uh, forward, some because of their vulnerability to climate uh, change, some because of the combination of uh, pollution impact that is also linked to uh, CO2 emissions. Whatever is the motivation, it is there. Looking at the wor what, what the World Bank can offer, though, to some of the countries that you mentioned who are still very much a coal-based economy, how do you get them off of that addiction? Even though it is making more economic sense, people will say, to invest in yeah. renewable energy, but it's more long-term. We invest on average around $10 billion every year in climate action. And we have made a commitment by 2020 to increase the share of our climate investments to 28% of our portfolio. This is another six, seven billion investment in climate action. A lot of people are saying increasingly that putting taxation, a tax on carbon may be the best answer. Uh, we have been working with the best minds on this planet, best economists, to come to a conclusion around what is that level. And we think that uh, price of around $60 per ton of carbon is where the process of transformation would accelerate. But politically, is it feasible? It is, uh, yes, it is politically feasible. Not easy, not immediate, but yes, it can be done. Look, when in the uh, late 90s we created the prototype carbon fund to make carbon a commodity to trade, 
many people were saying cannot be done. We don't have even the Kyoto Protocol at that time. Uh, it is politically very difficult. And then we had enough people who believed that it is so crucial to be done that it ought to be done even if it is impossible, so we made it possible. And if you look at the uh, uh, transformation that has happened on this topic of uh, um, carbon, five years ago we would have not been talking about carbon being a commodity uni universally accepted. Now you and I are debating what? The level of the price, not whether there should be price. So we have made progress. And, and, now and there the has to be a significant price for it to make and a difference. And now we have to push it so it is a significant uh, price. And I believe in my hearts of heart that this coalition that has emerged, and it has emerged around uh, Paris, of governments, citizens, scientists, and private sector, with the strong presence of local authorities, the mayors, it is lifting up climate action in a way that uh, not reversible and certainly a force for good. But we have to press more. And people like you bringing this topic to the public, uh, pressing people like me <laughs> to do more, that is how it is being done. So as we just heard from the CEO of the World Bank, millions face being driven into poverty by climate change. Others face losing the land they call home. One person who knows all about that is the poet and activist Kathy Jetnil Kitchener. She's from the Marshall Islands in the Pacific Ocean, which are threatened by rising sea levels. We can speak to her in just a moment, but first let's listen to her address to the UN General Assembly in 2014, when she moved many delegates to tears. Dear Matafele Benum, don't cry. Mommy promises you no one will come and devour you. No greedy whale of a company sharking through political seas. No backwater bullying of businesses with broken morals. No blindfolded bureaucracies gonna push this mother ocean over the edge. No one's drowning, baby. No one's moving. No one's losing their homeland. No one's becoming a climate change refugee. Kathy, in the couple of years since your performance at the UN General Assembly, have you and have the people of the Marshall Islands heard what they might have expected from world leaders on climate change? I think we've heard some of what we've expected. Um, I think that there is progress being made and that is exciting for us from our islands to hear. But I do think that there needs to be more ambition and that we need to make changes sooner rather than later. And so I think what we're hoping for is uh, forward thinking and kind of a lot more, a lot more to do with ending the fossil fuel industry now rather than later. And so that's what we're hoping to save our islands. What kind of specific actions do you think uh, world leaders who matter, who have been meeting in Paris can take? Well, I think that those who are, um, you know, especially those that are coming from first world industrial countries, they need to end fossil fuel now. They need to end the reliance of fossil fuels, the end the era of fossil fuels now. Keep it in the ground. Stop opening, you know, um, stop creating more opportunities to dig for coal or to dig for, um, you know, to, to rely on these kinds of fossil fuel industries. And we need to shift to 100% renewable energy as soon as possible. We need to hear the voices of indigenous people at the front lines. You know, our voices and our stories, and our pro and our you know our platforms need to be heard at every level. Do, and do you so think not you, just as you know victims of climate change, but as leaders? But but do you think uh, that world leaders can push more, should push more against uh, some of the special interest groups who have been fighting against efforts to decarbonize uh, uh, their economies? There are many here in the United States and elsewhere in the world who still argue that climate change is not an existential threat. What do you say to them? Um, I mean, I think that's already been disproven by a huge amount of scientists around the world. I think that most of the world has already, you know, come to the agreement that climate change is a real threat, is not is more than just an existential is an existential as well as but what a, is it like you for know, you specifically? Threat. What is it like for you and for your uh, mar fellow Marshallese? 
Well, I think for us, we're in the Marshall Islands, um, we are living, again, I said it's already, we're living in the front lines. You know, our islands are only two meters above sea level. There is ocean on either side of us. Um, it's so thin, there's no mountains, there's nowhere to run to. And so because of that, we see the changes that other people in the world don't see right away. And we're seeing the rising sea level, we're seeing floodings that are destroying homes, that are destroying our crops at a more frequent level than we've seen ever before. I mean, in the past five years alone, we've had four or five floodings a year, and that's more than we've ever seen before. We are having higher droughts. And I literally visited an island that 10 years ago was lush, full of coconut and pandanus trees, and is now just a pile of sand and rocks. It looks like a sandbar. This is what all of our islands could look like. And it's already happening right now. This isn't something that's happening you know, years down the line. Poet and uh, climate change activist Kathy Jethnal Kijiner, thank you very much. So two years after the Paris Agreement, we are coming to the end of another year of rising temperatures. And the question remains, are we really seeing meaningful steps or are the meetings, the public pronouncements and the photo ops a convenient cover for a lack of action? Because the planet is not waiting and the evidence is all around us. From a disappearing glacier in the far south of the Americas to a shrinking reservoir hit by drought in South Africa. Or this glacier in West Antarctica where another block of ice a mile long broke away this year to add to rising sea levels. And perhaps we must all ask ourselves if we are doing enough to hold our leaders to account and demand real change on an issue that will, sooner or later, affect us all. From me, Rida Fakhri, and the entire team here, goodbye.